So linear regression. That's what we're talking about. In the city of linear regression. In the city of linear regression. Okay, that's just bad. I know it's terrible. Okay, let's look at the objective. As I look at the objective here, we're going to, this is section 3.2, interpret the slope and the y-intercept of the least square regression line. We're not going to use a least square regression line to, in, to make a prediction. And we're going to talk about the dangers of extrapolation. We're not going to get to the residual plots yet. So let's get this started. Okay, so turn to page 6 of your notes. So first of all, let's talk about what a least square regression line is. Okay, it's a line that um, helps us to describe a relationship between the response variable and the explanatory. So in English, it helps us to establish the relationship between x and y. Okay, that is a least square regression line. Well, that is a regression line itself. Least squares is a little bit more specific. What do we use? We use it as a model to describe data. And yes, we knew, use it to make predictions. I remember many years ago when the market started to crash and we had a really bad economy, they predicted in like 2008 that it was going to make a turnaround in 2012. Okay, how did they do that based on different um, averages and analysis and looking at consumer um, confidence that was growing, etc.? From there, they were able to say, okay, in about 2012, we'll come up with our new norm and make a prediction that the economy is going to turn around. And they, weren't, they were not too off on that one. So that was a good thing. Now, as we look at this right here, the general form. So the general form, as you can see right here, is y equals a, b, well, y hat equals um, ax plus b. The book switches it around, but it does not matter. You're okay. Now, where x is the explanatory variable, y is the predicted value um, of the response. So here, y is the predicted value. The um, y-intercept right here, which is the value of b, we know that that is where our initial point is. And I can't forget about slope, which is the rate of change. Whenever you do these equations, you need to make sure to define each variable. Now, how is slope interpreted? So as you can see, I already have some stuff typed up here. But this is the thing about the AP test. They are very persnickety, yeah, very persnickety about the interpretation of slope. So yeah, it does tell us about the values and how the prediction is going to go in the slope and context, etc. Okay, but I like the way this book has actually um, defined it, or I should say, interpreted it. So for each additional, and then this is I'm gonna we're gonna fill in that blank. Increase, increase on average, and then there's another blank. The predicted amount of that's a blank right there increases or decreases by whatever the slope is. The increase or decrease means whether it's going to be a positive or negative. So this right here is a, a template you can also use. I have the template right here. But I'm going to slide down to an example. But I'm going to, before I talk about the example here, I'm going to talk about the y-intercept. The y-intercept is going to be the predictive value when um, x is 0. And as we do that, it may or may not be reasonable. So what I'm saying to you is as follows. If I'm talking about the y-intercept as a negative and we're talking about temperature, well, it is possible to go below zero. If I'm talking about being in debt, it is possible to go below zero. But is it possible to go negative when it comes to a person's body weight? Or is it possible to go negative before, you know, in, in a reference to a person's age? Well, I guess technically some people will say, well, does it negative mean you're still in the um, still in the mom's womb? Okay, yeah, I'll give you that one. But you know what I'm talking about. Now I want to slide down to an example, and this is an example that's from page 167 in our textbook, and um, it was referring to the price of the Ford 150 
given the amount of miles driven. So this was the equation that was um, determined. In which here is our slope and here is our y-intercept. And I'm just going to give the example of the slope because the y-intercept I'll just give verbally, no room to write it. But for, here's your value of the slope. So we're talking about for every or for each additional increase um, of miles driven, okay, which is basically kind of like the denominator of the slope. Okay, the predicted price of the F-150 will decrease by, why is it decreasing? Because that's a negative slope, decrease by $0.1629. So that's how this would work. For the y-intercept, we're saying that if we have no miles driven at all, the price of the car three, um, is $38,257. Um, um, okay, that's reasonable. So that y-intercept is a reasonable situation, and you can make a point of writing that down. Now I want to continue on and look at this next example, so please take a minute to read this. Okay, so here we're talking about um, um, an eccentric professor believes that, that a child with an IQ of 100 should have a reading test score of 50. He predicts that the reading score will increase by one um, point for every additional point of IQ. Sounds like a slope situation to me. Okay, so here, what is the equation of the professor's um, regression for predicting the reading score? Okay, so here, predicting the reading score is going to equal 1 IQ minus the, minus the 50, which is the um, starting value. Now let's talk about where I got this y-intercept right here. So in general, as I'm looking at this, this is saying that I'm going to go to, um, into math mode. Okay, so here's your x and here's your y, in which they said the x is the IQ and the y is the predicted re reading. So let me put down the word predicted. They gave us the value here of the IQ being 100 and the predicted reading being 50. Well, as I can see looking at this, they're expecting the difference between those. If you can take these and just, um, well, they're expecting it to be under 50. So I'm going 100 minus the 50, and that's where I get the starting point to be a negative um, 50 in terms of the predicted reading. Now, I'm telling you right now, does that even make sense? So far, no. How are you going to get a test score of a negative? You know, don't show up. I mean, really, don't show up. Okay, so, um, but this is where I got this um, equation from. Now, um, please remember when we're looking at this, as I go into statistics mode for a minute, I'm saying here, no, you cannot just leave it like that. You've got to, what did I say up there? Where to go, where to go? Make sure you define each variable. So you've got to define the variable, and then you can represent it like this, or I'll show you another way to represent it a little later. Um, but we can see here where the y-intercept came from, starting from this equation here. Okay, now I'm going to look at number 36. Take a minute, read it. Okay, now in this particular question, they're asking me for what is the slope. We want to interpret the value in context. So, and this is what I was talking about a little earlier. I like the second, um, what I wrote in here, this, it mimics the book a lot better. So, here, what is the slope? Here's my slope. Okay, define it. For each additional point in IQ, the predicted reading score will increase by... Um, 0.82 um, units because I don't remember seeing anywhere what that 0.82 um, represents specifically words or whatever so I'm just going to generically say units okay now let's go ahead and read problem number um, 38b 
Okay, so here the y-intercept is a negative 33.4, and we're getting that from where to go, where to go, this value right there. And um, they're saying the predicted score of the chill is going to be zero um, um, with um, for a child with a zero is going to be a negative 33.4. So that's not possible. How do, I mean, how do you have an IQ that's below zero? Okay, so that's where that came from. Now I want to go back and talk about problem 36 really quickly. I've never seen a problem like this on the AP test or the multiple choice. So if you're concerned on, well, how did that, how did you come up with your equation? In statistics, what they do is you've got your raw data, you plug the raw data in, you come up with the equation based on the raw data, and then you interpret that data, and then you make predictions about that data. And yes, we have to analyze the slope and the y-intercept and if it's reasonable or not. So if you're worried about this, don't worry about it. Worry about knowing, as we look at this right here, this equation and what, to, what it represents, what each component represents, and like I said in the future, coming, how we can make a prediction. Oh, wait for it, wait for it. Ah, there's our prediction. So we need to find the predicted score of, um, for a child with an IQ of 90. So what do you think you're going to do? Yep, plug it in. Okay, so here I just take the 90, plug it in. Remember the y hat represents predicted, the predicted value of y. And yes, I defined them again, but honestly I didn't have to because it was already defined earlier in the problem. But I just wanted to show, remember I said I was going to show you another representation of that? Well, here it is. Here's another way that this information can be, um, this equation can be um, given. Here, and please notice what's happening, is I've defined each of the variables, which... I mentioned earlier right here make sure you define each variable okay or you can have the definition of the variable infused in the equation but let's go back so here you just take it plug it in it's 45 so the predicted reading score is going to be um, 45.9 just do the math Now, I mentioned a little earlier, a couple seconds ago, actually, that um, looking at the prediction, if it is reasonable, which takes us to this phrase, extrapolation. Extrapolation is when we make a prediction of the value when it's far outside the interval. Um, meaning, if I have, if this is the year 20, um, we're in 2016 right now. Okay, and I want to make a prediction about the year 2025. Well, that's a serious extrapolation. Why? We have not, an, even if we do have enough of a pattern to say, okay, it happened this year, it happened five years ago, it happened 10 years ago. Are we seriously going to go, what did I say, 2025? Are we going to seriously go nine years away to determine let's say what the economy is going to look like or what the unemployment rate is going to look like. It's just way too far away. That's extrapolation. So that's what I'm referring to here. Um, the predictive value far outside the interval pattern of the values um, that are given to you by the x values. So that's what an extrapolation is. It's dangerous because predictions are not accurate. Like I just said earlier, how are we going to predict something that's nine years away, no matter how much prior history that we have? And we can, but is it going to be legitimate? So let's look at this problem. Go ahead and read problem 40. Now, okay, so please notice I'm asking you to identify the slope, explain what it means in this setting. Okay, so we have monthly temperatures, natural gas um, in her home. So here, first of all, this value right here is the slope coefficient of x. So for each additional increase in the average monthly temperature, the predicted amount of gas consumed in this house is going to be dis um, 
um, is going to decrease by 19.87 um, cubic feet. And remember I told you, looking at that template, things that I'm very consistent about. Here for each additional, okay, and here we're talking about degree, but here we're talking about increase. The average, and then I say the predicted amount of, and then that's context. And I mentioned the idea of increase or decrease. And then by here, here's the value of the slope. So um, get to know and understand that template. Next, it wants me to identify the y-intercept of the line, um, explain why it is risky. So the y-intercept is the value right there, the 14.25. It's risky because it's an extrapolation. Zero here, they don't have any data right here that's below, I would say below 20, since that's 30, that's 35, maybe below 25. So um, remember how I mentioned the idea of extrapolation being outside the, the, um, the, the given intervals? And I want to be a little bit more specific in terms of math. Let's say it's outside the given domain. So look at the domains right here going from 25 approximately to 60. Well, if I give you, if I ask for something that's in the 70s, it's an extrapolation. If I ask for something that's below this 25, it's an extrapolation. So because of that, it's too risky, which means that, you know, if the point of a least square regression line is to make a prediction, this is not going to be a legitimate prediction. Okay, now, next we want to use the, use this to, um, figure out what the temperature is going to be when it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, 30 degrees Fahrenheit is in here. It is inside of that interval, so it is very reasonable. So you take it, you plug it in, and there is your answer. Now, I kept slipping up, and I kept saying least square regression line, regression line. There is a difference, but the reality is it's only a difference that you need to know for a multiple choice problem on the test or SAT um, or the um, or the um, the not the SAT for the multiple choice or the um, or the AP test I should say a least square regression line is a line that makes the sum of the squares of the residuals as small as possible so your thoughts should be okay what the heck is that Yarbrough what the heck is that let's look at this right here so first of all I talked about the sum of the squares of the residual. So my first question is, what is a residual? Okay, a residual is the observed minus the predicted in terms of a, on the least square regression line. So here, anything that is on that line right there is your predicted value. So that is equivalent to, let's go back, the idea of the line of best fit. The line of best fit gives us the idea of the predicted. But as we look at this right here, are these dots? These dots are actually the observed values or the actual data that we have. And did I miss one? So what happens is we are trying to find the difference between the what the observed would be, because right here the observed would be that value right there. But it's but that would be I mean, I'm sorry, here's the observed, this would be the predicted value. So the prediction value is over. Here, I'm going to go to another tiny one. Here is the, um, the observed or the actual, but here's the predicted. Again, we over predict it. Here, here is the um, observed or the actual, and right up here is the predicted. Again, we over predict it. All of these are overpredicted, which tells me this is not a good um, least square regression line in the first place, because we should have some that are a little over and some that are a little under, which takes me to this one right here, very tiny, very tiny to see. Okay, my prediction is here laying on the line, and what I actually found out or the observed is slightly above it. So on this one, we underpredict it for this point right here. So let's recap. Whenever it's laying on the line, that is the predicted. The observed are the other values. The observed are the, is the actual true gathered data. And the purpose for the least square regression line, or the line of best fit if you take yourself back to that ideology, is to make a prediction 
um, about the future. So the least square regression line, what it does is it minimizes the errors. So as I see here, it makes the sum of the square of the residuals. Let's make a note. It minimizes the errors. And when I say it minimizes the errors, we're talking about what the observed values are or the actual versus the predicted. So as I talk about it minimizes the errors, we're talking about it minimizes the residual. Okay, so as I wrap this video up, I want to talk about these problems right here, problem um, 42 and 44, and it tells us to refer back to the gas situation up a little higher. So let's read this. So the question is, would it be appropriate to use this regression line to um, for 65 degrees Fahrenheit? So here is your 65. Let's go back and look at where is it on the graph. Well, 65 is going to be over here somewhere. So for that reason, it's an extrapolation. So no, it's outside the interval. So it's outside the, we like the word domain. Add that to it. And since it's outside the domain, um, it's going to be an extrapolation. And remember, extrapolation is bad. Because if we use something, if something is being used to make a prediction, and it's going to be a bad prediction, what's the point of having it in the first place? The next thing I wanted to talk about and the last thing is explain the phrase least, square regress least squares to a person that doesn't know statistics. Well, least square or the least square regression line um, is basically you are looking for your errors. So the least square regression line makes residuals. So here, simply stated, is the purpose of the least square is to find out what the errors are, and we want it to be the smallest possible errors. The closest those points are, the smaller the squares are, and the smaller the squares are, the closer these observed values are to that of the predicted. So that means that predicted line is a better line which takes me to that first video, that, that opening. So as I wrap this up, please notice what's happening here. This right here is the prediction line, the line in the red. So here, what's happening? Okay, I need to pause. Okay, so this is what I'm saying. As you can see, this red line here is the um, regression line. So when we're talking about the least squares, we're looking at here's the predicted right here, and here is the actual or the observed value, so the true data that we accepted. And so we are finding the distance between the observed and the predicted, and I'll be honest, the only reason we make this, they refer to the least squared, is to eliminate any negative values. Please recognize right here that in this particular situation that I'm looking at, the line over predicts. Okay, because this is the true value. So let's think of this as the price of a car. This is how much it actually is. Here, this is the predicted value. They're overcharging us. But let's look at the situation over here. This is a clear one. This is the prediction line. Let's say this is the amount um, of a car depreciation, depreciating. So they're saying that this is the value of the car. Okay, That's what they predict the value of the car to be. But in this case right here, we're finding, well, the actual price of the car is higher than that of the predicted value. Okay, How can that affect you? In either situation, it could affect how much money you would have to pay or you would end up losing um, if it comes to, let's say, getting a, another car or a, new, oh, a used car. So as you continue to look at this picture right here of the idea of this is the perfect picture of a least square regression line. Because the, as these squares, if I had a magic wand to make these squares smaller, 
If they were small like that, if they were small like that, they were small like that. But if they were small like that, that means that this data right here would be the observed. And that means this data right here would be the observed. And that means this data right here would be the observed. And then if I made another one, that means this data right here would be in it would be the observed. And the smaller the squares, the closer the line, um, the better the line, I'm going to say, of best fit is. So, hasta la vista, guys. Have fun. Bye-bye.